highly favored one I appreciate you joining me on the healing streams reflection the title for today's post is God's word makes us productive how much fruit are you bearing in your Christian life occasionally when I ask my church members or other believers a question like that I get blank or guilty looks some are not sure what I mean fruit they don't own an orchard they are lucky if they can keep the dust off the rose bushes others think I want them to whip out a list of souls one to Christ. This particular month, year, or maybe a particular season. And because their list is quite short on an existence, they feel guilty. What then is Christian fruit? Does it have something to do with the fruit? of the Spirit, just how does a Christian bear fruit in daily living? And what part does God's Word play in all this? When you look at the biblical passage on fruit bearing in John 51 to 8, Jesus and the disciples uh, in the upper room on the night before his death, as he is about to leave, the Lord stops and says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And even and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear f- much fruit, so you will be my disciples. John 15, 1 to 8. Here is one of the most meaningful and at the same time most difficult analogies in the entire Bible. Here is also one of the richest passages in the New Testament on living the Christian life. Jesus is the vine, and his father is the gardener. Or vine dresser. The disciples are the branches. He was speaking of the eleven disciples who were still with him as he prepared to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They were the branches who were remaining with him to the end. The branches who didn't bear fruit and were cut off are represented by Judas who had already left in order to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders later that evening. Jesus used the vine illustration for at least three good reasons. First, his disciples would recognize the analogy immediately because Israel was often referred to as a vine in the Old Testament scriptures. Even the prophet Isaiah wrote, 
the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Isaiah 5, 7. Jeremiah speaking for God said, I have planted you an above vine, a seed of highest quality. Jeremiah 2, 21. Second, the grapevine grew everywhere in Palestine. Even some biblical scholars in fact believe Jesus stopped at the doorway on his way out of the upper room to refer to a vine growing by the doorway. When he spoke of pruning procedures, he was describing exactly what vine dressers did to produce good crops of grapes. Young vines were pruned severely for their first three years. Then they allowed to bear crop. Mature vines are pruned every December and January. Non-fruit bearing branches were cut back mercilessly to preserve the strength of the plant. And as Jesus pointed out on this, on this his analogy, he, the wood of the pruned branches was good for nothing except making bonfires. Thirdly, the vine and its branches perfectly shows the kind of relationship that must exist between Jesus and anyone who wants to be disciples. Although Jesus was addressing his inner circle of 11 disciples, this analogy is for Christians, you and I, inclusive. Jesus is saying we have a choice to be real branches who truly remain with Jesus and bear fruit or to be funny and productive branches who appear to be connected to the vine but are not. Like Judas, these funny branches will fade away and produce no fruit at all. Their ultimate fate is destruction. It's important to know that Jesus says, I am the true vine. In the Old Testament, Israel had been referred to as a vine planted, tended, and pruned by God. But Israel had become unproductive. In fact, the symbol of the vine used in Old Testament passages always refers to the idea of degeneration. Hosea cried out that Israel was an empty vine. Hosea 10.1 Now with the Old Testament of the ending and the new covenant just installed at the last supper. Jesus stated clearly that he is the true vine. It is to him that God, God's children must now be related. For anyone to know life and bear fruit, that person must be connected to Jesus Christ. Beloved, the task of the gardener our vine dresser is crucial to understanding the vine and branches. Illustration. The gardener is the father who has two ministries concerning the branches on the vine, concerning those who claim allegiance to Jesus Christ. In the first century, a vine dresser will have two duties to cut off branches that bear no fruit and to prune the fruit-bearing branches in order to help them bear even more fruit. The word prune also means to purge or to cleanse. The vine dresser will cleanse the fruit-bearing branches in various ways. Sometimes he will use his thumb and forefinger to pinch away the green tip of a vigorous but unwanted shoot. Sometimes he will top the branch by looping off a foot or two to keep it from growing too large or too long and possibly snapping off in the wind. At other times, he will thin the vine by removing unwanted flower clutters. The vine dresser's one goal in all this was to make the plant more productive, to make it bear more and bear fruit. When we compare the vine dresser's work with an actual grapevine to the Father's work with us, we can see there are two kinds of Christians. Just as there are two kinds of branches. First, there are those who claim to follow Christ 
But are not true believers. Second, there are those who truly believe and who bear at least some fruit in their lives. The face of the non-fruit bearing branches gives us an awesome warning. Those who are Judas branches, those who do not really believe in and remain with Christ, have to be cast into eternal fire. It is not a question of these people losing their salvation. They were never saved in the first place. Sooner or later, they show their real colors and their end is destruction. True believers, however, always bear fruit. Every Christian bear some kind of fruit. It may not be much. With some Christians, you may have to look a long time to find a few lingering grapes. But they are there. If there is no fruit at all, that person is not a true Christian. The essence of the Christian life is that it must be spiritually productive in some way. Ephesians 2.10 A person may appear as if he is connected to Jesus Christ. But if he doesn't bear any fruit, he is not really connected to Christ at all. The Father's work with the fruit-bearing branches is another matter. Beloved, in this instant, he carefully prunes the Christian, trimming away sins, hindrances, and evil habits in order to help that Christian gain maximum fruit-bearing capacity. One of the most effective ways the Father prunes the Christian is with trouble, even pain and suffering. This is not to say that every Christian who is ill or suffering is necessary being pruned. But in many cases, the Father allows trial and trouble to come out and come our way in order to clean out our lives in certain areas. Unfortunately, pruning has to be done with a knife. And therefore, pruning is always painful. There are times when we wonder if God knows what he's doing because it hurts so much. It seems more than we can bear. And sometimes we wonder why God seems to be doing an awful lot of pruning on our branch. While other Christians didn't experience the same type of pruning. But all we can do is trust. The Father knows what he's doing. The valuable lessons he teaches us through suffering, trials and troubles have waken us to the changes we need to make. What we need to add to our lives and what we need to remove. The Father causes his pruning in many ways. It can be anything from sickness to hardship, such as the loss of a job. It can be the loss of a loved one of a good friend. Pruning can come through frustration, disappointment, pressure, and stress. God ordains all kinds of troubles in order to clean up those unwanted shoots, those habits, attitudes, and practices that drain away our energy and rob us of our fruit-bearing capacity. God doesn't do this pruning with glee or vengeance. He is not a great slasher in the sky. My dear brother, my dear sister, flooding away with a giant blade, snarling, oh, bear more fruit or else. No, he's right at our side. The gardener who carefully prunes each of us had the right spots so we can bear more fruit. The pruning knife may hurt now and then, but it's worth it. Have you ever thought about what the father, father's pruning knife actually is? Is it suffering? Is it troubles or frustrations? I don't think it is any of those. Because in John chapter 15 verse 3 tells me that the pruning knife is the word of God. Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. I believe that 
in this verse, Jesus is referring to two kinds of cleansing for the disciples. First, the initial salvation comes through hearing the word. Second, the continual purging and pruning is done by the word. That is why he says, Nest, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. John 15, 4. And just how do we remain in Christ and have him remain in us? It is by being in the word. There are no substitutes, my brother, my sister. No gimmicks. No shortcuts. God's pruning knife is his word. And as pointed from the beginning, he seems to use it often during trouble, distress, and setbacks. I remember Charles Spurgeon's word. Charles Spurgeon was a master preacher of the 19th century who said, it is the word that prunes the Christian. It is the truth that purges him. Have you ever notice how much more sensitive you are to the word of god when trouble comes have you ever noticed that when you have a particular need or a problem certain verses will leap off the page that's the spirit of god applying them to your heart i pray that the spirit of god will apply them to your spirit, soul, and body. So that you grow from glory to glory and excel in all things. Thank you. And may God richly bless you for listening. And bye for now. <laughs>